Well, thanks for that introduction, Jerry. Um, it's just me up here talking, and I'm going to give, I'll give you a fair warning on this. It's, it's like I teach my classes. I love to give all the details, okay? So you're going to see a bunch of stuff that you're going to scratch your head, okay? But just pay attention to kind of the summaries at the end. I, 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 they do this because I feel obligated to present some of the people who actually did the work, put their data up on the board. That's why I do it. So, And all you really have to do is look, some of these things are going to be brightly colored, green and red things, and you just have to find a pattern in those. You'll, you'll see on some of these microarray analysis panels that there's two patterns. And in certain cases, that tells us whether or not a cancer uh, is good cancer that you can cure, or not so good cancer that you can't cure. So we can do that diagnosis using this gene expression technology. We also um, can look at breast cancer. Again, there are two patterns that we determine by analyzing the gene expression in the tumors. And it tells us that if you have this pattern, you have your mastectomy, but you will not need any adjuvant therapy. No radiation, uh, no chemotherapy. So, and of course you're on the other side, then you're gonna have, need the radiation and, and chemotherapy. So that eliminates a lot of the costs and pain and suffering in treating breast cancer. So that's the, the two highlights, I think. And I'm gonna also talk about uh, stem cells, just because everybody asks about them, and some of the new drugs, monoclonal antibody drugs, and we'll, we'll get through all this. So I'm going to walk you through first about personalized medicine, and we're going to walk through a little lesson on DNA. You have to go back to your high school biology. I think most of you probably had high school biology when Watson and Crick discovered the uh, structure of DNA. <laughs> I had one person who didn't, you know, didn't have it in their high school biology. Maybe they just forgot. So, personalized medicine, what is it? Why is it necessary? How does it affect us? And we're gonna look at drug genotype interactions. And the, the bottom line is that by looking at our genes, we can determine uh, if you're gonna have issues with drug interactions. We also use these gene expression uh, data to actually categorize new drugs and what they do, what they don't do. And then all, and finally, we're going to talk about cancer and tumors, where we can actually classify the tamer, uh, tumors and provide a prognosis. And ultimately, we hope to use some of this technology to guide therapy, you know, which, what combination of drugs are going to work best for that particular cancer. So I'm going to walk you through kind of basic molecular biology, talk about DNA, RNA, and proteins, a little bit about genetic variation, and walk you through the Human Genome Project, and talk about DNA chips, drugs, drug signatures, and cancer. And down at the end, I'll, I'll, I'll touch on monoclonal antibodies, stem cells. And the last thing down at the bottom, you've probably seen that in the news a lot, it's called CRISPR. This is a gene editing technology where we can actually go inside cells and correct genes. So the World Health Organization says there are approximately 10,000 human genes that cause disease. They're single genes, and mutations in those genes cause the disease, things like sickle cell anemia, beta thalassemia, and things like that. We now have technology where we can go in and correct that gene. It's amazing, and it's all coming to fruition as we speak. All right, this is the central paradigm of molecular biology. DNA is the genetic material it needs to be replicated as you go through cell divisions. The RNA is the intermediate molecule. The DNA is transcribed into RNA, and that information is uh, ultimately translated into a protein. And the protein is what gives you your phenotype, what you look like, basically, in a simple thing. Okay, so the uh, genetic code, or the genes, is made up of these simple letters, A, 
C, G, T. Those are bases in DNA. They're a chemical that's in your DNA. These four letters make up the book of DNA for life for every single one of you. It determines your, your health, it determines how your body works and all that, and it obviously determines your inheritance, what you pass on to your children. So the DNA, when we look at it, it's made up these four bases. Don't, this is all science now. I feel obligated to do some science when I'm up here, but uh, it's made up of these four bases signified by ACGT. And there's a different one that's in the RNA. We won't even talk about that. Don't worry about that. So when we look at DNA, this is maybe what you were lucky enough to go through high school not so long ago. You've probably seen models of DNA like this. This is the Watson Crick DNA, how the DNA is actually structured. So the DNA is the information for making proteins. It's nothing more than chains of amino acids which give its organ, uh, gives the organism its phenotype or physical appearance. It goes through the process of replicating the DNA and then it transcribes portions of the DNA into RNA and those are translated into amino acids. So genetic, vari <clears throat> genetic variation. Uh, when <clears throat> Human Genome Project started, uh, we began to find that there's genetic variation in the human population. But for the most part, about 99.9% .9 of our DNA in every single one of us is identical to the person sitting next to you, okay? But there are some genetic variations. So in essence, we're all the same, yet we are different. And if you look at the races up there, we like to classify people by races, and that's the phenotype. Unfortunately, the genetic basis of race doesn't really hold up because you can see the races up there. You can see uh, African-American, you can see uh, Caucasians, Asians, and the three races, the genetic variation uh, is actually more within a particular race than it is between races. So there really is no genetic basis for race. And that's just another look at that. And um, it, when, when I say that, everybody goes, you, are you kidding me? <laughs> Anyhow, uh, so the difference is, what's genetic variation? It's difference in, in the linear sequence of those letters, A, C, G, T, in your book of DNA and in certain individuals. The vast majority of nucleotide bases are identical, as I already said. There are a very small number of differences. And they can lead to certain diseases or even tumor heterogeneity. So why do we need these new drugs? Well, um, it's because of the knowledge we gain. We basically have sequenced the entire human genome and genomes of many other organisms. And so our base of knowledge has changed. So we got tw some 20 to 20, 25,000 genes. And, um, and we've determined new biochemical pathways. We discovered all sorts of things by sequencing the entire human genome. So the Human Genome Project was an effort, a worldwide effort, that took a little over 10 years. It was completed in 2003. And it involves basically isolating DNA from an individual and isolating it and sequencing it. There's the double helix there. And that tells us information about the ultimate proteins which are made from that DNA. So who participated in the human genome? It was a worldwide participation. It was the United States Department of Energy, National Institutes of Health, uh, UK, Medical Research Council, and you see 18 other companies, uh, countries I should say. So it started slowly in the 80s because the technology of automated sequencing of DNA and I'll tell you right up front that the human genome is 3 billion of those ACs, Gs, and Ts. It takes a long time to sequence that. So the technology was slow to develop. You can see it down at the bottom from 19 early's, and then finally, right around 2000, it exploded. We developed some automated sequencing 
technology. So the goal of the human genome was to identify the approximate um, 25,000 genes in human DNA, determine the sequence of those genes, put this information in databases, and make this, these databases available for analysis and transfer this technology to, to the private sector. The other thing was a very important part of the human genome because we saw the, uh, the potential harm if this information falls in the wrong hands. I mean, if you have some bad genes and your life insurance gets a hold of your DNA, they'll raise your rates, believe me. So all this information is treated in a confidential way. And again, this is just a diagram of you know, how this is done. We set up these reactions, and initially we ran them out on these gels which separate the DNA based on size, and the machinery looked like this. These are two of the earlier ones, the ABI and the, the Megabase. So these can sequence, uh, basically, this one says 96. I think the one on the right there does uh, 384 uh, sequences at a time. And so this automated sequencing, this is what the data actually looks like. Again, just look at the pretty colors. Uh, but that's the real data. And it gets analyzed and read out, and you can see how we can read the sequences there. The, the cytosines are in blue, uh, the thymines in red, and so on and so forth. And you can see how it's red. And, and this is the machine on the left is the new, newer version. This is a capillaries. So we can do 384 in parallel. So what did we learn by this? Well, the human genome contains, as I said, 3,164.7 million, that's over 3 billion, uh, of these A, C's, G's, and T's. The average gene is about 3,000 of those letters long, and it varies in, greatly in size. The largest gene, I think, that we know is the uh, human gene for dystrophin, which is 2.4 million bases, that gene by itself. So we learned that the number of genes is approximately pushing a little bit more than 25,000 now, and it's much lower than what the original estimates was, were of 80 to 140,000 genes. But as I said, about 99% of all these gene, uh, sequences are the same in all people. And we're still working out functions of all these genes. At this time, this is a few years ago now, we still had about 30%. We didn't have a clue what the genes actually did, but we knew they were genes. So when we look at a human genome, it's very, I'll call it redundant. There's a lot of DNA, and only 2% of it is used for information. So 98% of it originally got termed as junk DNA. And um, it turn, ends up being these sequences that it, we call repetitive DNAs, which are repeated over and over. And we now think those have function, but they don't function in... in and gene expression, they function in the organization of the DNA in your cell. And the other thing that you learned when we looked at this and, and some of the sequence data, there, there has been a dramatic uh, decrease seems to have occurred in the rate of these repeated sequences in the human genome. Genes appear to be concentrated in random areas along the genome, and there are vast expanses of non-coding DNA in between those. And you can see up to 30,000 Gs and Cs repeating over and over in the so-called junk DNA. Some other facts, the chromosome 1, which is the longest chromosome, has approximately, and it's probably now over 3,500 genes on it. And the Y chromosome, for men, uh, only has 231. So it only takes 231 genes to be a man, I guess. So we went ahead and sequenced some other organisms. You might ask why. Well, we can learn a lot from these. And you know, these are genetically well-characterized organisms. Uh, there's hepatitis, it's a small virus. E. coli is a common bacteria. Yeast, common yeast, baker's yeast. Uh, Drosophila fruit fly. Arabidopsis is this little weedy plant. And then you got our friend the mouse. 
And notice that it's very similar to us, that it the, has the same amount of DNA. Matter of fact, your DNA and a mouse DNA really only varies by about 2%. Now you see why it's justified in calling somebody a rat, I guess. Um, this is the, so that DNA is spread on, this is just a human karyotype, and you can see the longest chromosome is one, you can see the Y chromosome here, down in, at the bottom here. So let's look at some of the other uses of this information. And one thing we can look at is drug genotype interactions. So how you, uh, metabolize and react to certain drugs is determined by your genetics. And 1950s, uh, we first noticed this inherited difference in drug response was observed. And in the 1980s, we, we cloned the first gene that's involved in metabolizing some of these drugs that you may take. And of course, in 1990s through the present, the human genome is sequenced, and we developed this micro or micro uh, uh, technology, so-called DNA chips. So what are some of the causes in the variability of, re of response to drugs? Well, you all probably heard this already. Clearly, the environment. You probably heard about don't take drugs with grapefruit juice, right? Other things also can cause them. I mean, some cheeses, um, and of, of course, just your overall condition. So, uh, and, and I think they give you that warning in, in the pharmacy about not taking, don't take your drugs with, with grapefruit juice. And it's kind of an interesting thing because you think of grapefruit juice, it's, it's acidic. It's going in your stomach, which is also acidic. Why would, why would grapefruit juice do it? I don't know. They just tell me that. And it does happen. My view on it is if you drink the, you know, the juice in the morning, you could probably take your medicine in the afternoon and it's not gonna do any, it's not gonna harm the medicine. What it does is it actually inactivates some drugs is what happens. So one of the first uh, uh, things we found in humans was in the military. And this is the um, anti-malarial uh, drug called uh, Primaquin. And We've, they found in the military that about 10% of African-American soldiers had adverse side effects when, if they took this drug. And you can see the graph of it over there. So we now can screen people, screen their genetics, and determine whether or not they're going to be sensitive or not sensitive. Um, aspects of drug metabolism can affect drug response in patients, and we'll go through a, a lack of enzyme activity leads to breakdown, uh, toxic uh, drug products, no enzymatic activity, obviously it can't reach its intended target, and persistent or rapid purging of a drug because of mutant uh, enzyme. And we now have ways of, of you know, finding these things out and, and dealing with them, and this all can be be screened in individuals now. So we took this information and we made what we call whole genome chips from a number, number of organisms, including humans. And I'll tell you about how these things are made and tell you a little bit about drug signatures, how we can classify various drugs, and then we'll finish up with cancer at the end. So this chip, basically you have the DNA, it's on that chip on the bottom, and it's called capture probes, and the green and the blue things there are RNA, and that's gene expression. And we can actually quantitate gene expression of every single gene in your cells and in your body. So this is just a way, a crude way we used to do it in the lab when we first started this, uh, just a little... So we have that DNA on a chip, and then we can actually compare normal cells to treated cells. So you can 
hit human cells with a drug, and you can determine how your gene expression is uh, altered by the presence of, that, presence of that drug. So you extract the nucleic acid out of it, you run it through uh, hybridization, and that little slide there is a, a representation of the raw data. The thing at the bottom is uh, how that data gets clustered and classified. So this is the basics. The DNA is on the solid support, uh, glass or plastic. The RNA is labeled with a fluorescent label, so we can see it. We can see the, the fluorescence here. We see it in, the, in this particular case, not that clear, but there are actually red, yellow, and green spots in there. And DNA is what's on the slide. So by looking at these, we can actually tell which genes are being turned up, upregulated we call it, and those are the ones in red. The ones that are being downregulated, those are in green, and those that stay pretty much the same are in yellow. So we can look at the effects of all sorts of chemicals, drugs, on your genome by using this techn uh, technology. So this is something that was done in my lab uh, at Operon, and we use a model organism, yeast, and we put the whole yeast genome on this chip. And, and you can see what these individual little squares got printed with that machine that I showed you earlier. And so we, we looked at two treatments of these cells, and nothing drug-related in this particular. It, it, the two conditions we did, we took some of the yeast and heated it. And we, all, we know that when you heat up an organism, there's a response to the heat. It's called the heat shock response. So when you look at what happens here, um, don't worry about this. Look red. Those genes are being upregulated, okay? And those genes, most of them end up being what we call heat shock genes. Genes over on the right are being downregulated, and those are other genes which are downregulated during either heat shock, which is, I think, the first four lanes over here, and a shift in growing conditions of the yeast. Not that important. The pattern is really what you want to look at. So we didn't take uh, this information, and we can classify and profile these genes. The data gets manipulated. And we actually can determine uh, chemical-specific profiles. As I said, we can now look at what a particular drug, in this case, in this particular case it's a fibrate, uh, gemfibrozole, and we can determine what genes are being affected. Um, and the other useful thing for drug discovery, we can, you know, basically we can look, if we have some unknown compound that we think might do something, we can profile it and we can get some sort of idea how good it is. And to make a long story short, you want to, when you have a drug, you want to target very specific things like the cholesterol pathways, statins, for example. And so you want to target those, but you don't want to be affecting other genes. And by doing this technology, we can screen drugs, and if they affect a lot of other genes, not the target genes in, involved in the cholesterol pathway, um, there's a good, uh, good chance that that drug will have lots of side effects, okay? And here's just another look at the patterns again. You'll see a lot of these. Um, at least they're colorful. You, you guys are still probably scratching your head about this, but um, but we can now classify. You know, and we see the fibrates, and we're looking at a specific set of genes, the beta oxidase genes, and there's very specific pattern of gene expression when cells are exposed to that. Now, a friend of mine developed a, a way as a company that actually uh, developed a way of doing drug signatures. And this does exactly what I was just talking about. It gives you a signature for the drug, so you can tell what type of drug it is. And it also tells you whether or not you're affecting too many other genes. And you can see um, over on the, uh, uh, here, statins. Anybody here take statins? Yeah. You see, they all have the same signature. And those are Crestor, Lipitor, Zocor. The, the generic names are on the bottom. But they all have pretty much the same signature. 
And so we can tell a statin drug. The interesting thing, now, if you look at um, fibrates, they're down here, and they affected, they have a different drug signature. However, if you look over here where the, the statins are, there is some similarity between what you see in the statins, which would say maybe there could be some sort of interaction between fibrates and statins. It's not very strong, but we, we can get that information out of there. But we can take and look at any drug, and it has a drug signature, as we call it. Now, of course, uh, this affects development of drugs. Worldwide, uh, sorry, these are a little bit old, these statistics, but in 2011, there was over an 880 billion spent on worldwide expenditures on pharmaceuticals. And the cost of drug discovery uh, from, from discovery to approval is estimated between 350 million to 1.5 billion per drug. And we all know that drug costs are continually increasing. This technology allows us to be a little bit more accurate about and, and we have more information about potential side effects, and so it actually helps us make better drugs. Now, this is the justification why these companies charge so much for your drugs. You know, it's 12 years for experimental drugs to reach the market. Only one in five make it to market. Clinical trials take six years. You submit a package of uh, documentation to the... Uh, to the government, and that's over 100,000 pages. Now, do you think anybody reads all those pages? No. And drug companies know how to hide data. So it's all in there. But um, we, we push drugs to market more quickly than most other uh, countries. So this technology is develop into a field which we call pharmacogenomics. That's a mouthful. Um, and this is just basically where we're able to better, do better drug development. And we can look at genotypes uh, of individuals. We can uh, also exclude patients with at-risk genotypes. And this actually helps pharmaceutical pharm companies to improve the efficacy numbers and reduce the number of volunteers needed to show the benefits of a new drug. Cancer. Now, we're going to look at this uh, as it's used for prognosis and diagnosis. These are the statistics on cancer, and these are from 2011, I believe, or 2016. I can't remember. Oh, yeah, it is 2016. And these numbers actually are, I don't think they're increasing greatly. I, the numbers vary depending on how many illnesses are really determined to be a specific cancer. But two of the ones that are on here is breast cancer and lymphoma. And we'll talk about those a little bit more. So what was done, we basically, uh, they isolated B cell lymphoma cells from a number of patients and they analyzed gene expression. And you can see up the top of this thing, there's a bifurcation. And you can see a pattern over here and a pattern over here. And to make a long story short, if you have the left-hand side of pattern in your B cell lymphoma cells, you have a form that is easily treated. Unfortunately, if you have the other pattern over here, it's a form that's not so easily treated. So we get that diagnosis, and we can diagnose two major classes of B-cell lymphoma. Let's look at breast cancer. Now, breast cancer, um, it's the same thing. Uh, just different genes, all that. And again, we have this bifurcation. Two sides, one here, one here. And again, believe me, it's, the data is all here. The an analysis is done by you know, statist uh, statisticians, and we can make this call with reasonable uh, probabilities. 
And the bottom line for breast cancer is if you have this pattern over here in your breast tumor, you will not need chemo or radiation. It does you no good. If you have this pattern over here, you will need the chemo and the radiation after the mastectomy has been done. And this technology is, is available today. One more final uh, look at, we'll look at a, acute myeloid uh, leukemia. This is another set of data, and you can see, again, we've got classifications, uh, ma two major uh, classifications and patterns here. There's actually a whole set of minor patterns in there, which we won't get into that at all. But again, we now have the ability to classify tumors, have a prognosis, and in the long run, we hope using this gene expression technology, we can actually guide therapy, which drugs are working, which drugs are not working. Okay. I'm gonna talk a little, a little bit about stem cells. Everybody's seen stem cell signs and storefronts all over town here, right? Are those really stem cells? Some of the stuff they call stem cells is not stem cells. And some people are doing things with stem cells that they really shouldn't be doing. But we're going to touch on stem cells because these are cells that basically were, were used to, uh, well, they were initially isolated in um, human embryos. So there was a lot of uh, kind of social issues in dealing with human embryos. Now this. Many of, these, many of these things come from in vitro fertilization clinics. And typically when they do an in vitro fertilization, they fertilize multiple eggs and they implant them. And then they take some of those eggs that are not implanted and they freeze them in liquid nitrogen and they stay there for years. Once the client has their baby, that's no use to them, even though it's a viable clump of cells. It has the ability to make a few, uh, full human. So these stem cells, and at, when you get them at that stage, they're what we call plural point, uh, pluripotent. So that stem cell in the early embryos has the ability to make any type of cell in your body. It can make nerve cells, muscle cells, you name it, it can do it. All it has to do is get in the environment of where those cells are, and it will differentiate into those cells. Now, people have been uh, trying things like uh, trying to repair hearts with stem cells. I think people have uh, also done some arthritis work with uh, stem cells. Um, but we were relatively limited with the uh, stem cells because we had to get them from human embryos. Now, just this and in, in the next few things I'll also talk about, too. So when we look at, oops, sorry, went the wrong way. They, if you saw the 60 Minutes a few weeks ago, they had George Church on. And his lab, this is at Harvard, they now develop ways that they can take fibroblasts, so they can do a little punch biopsy on people, do a little bit of genetic manipulations, and get stem cells from you. That gives you stem cells that are genetically more or less identical to yours, and there's, there's less chance of that causing any adverse effects. So this technology is developed at uh, uh, George Church's lab, and literally that's a fibroblast uh, cell that you see here under the light microscope. You can see it a little bit better here. So we now have that ability. So um, there's going to be a bunch of new information coming out about using stem cells I mean, in animals, they've been able to cure deafness in animals. They've been able to cure uh, some uh, sight problems in animals. They've actually been able to repair uh, spinal cords, not completely, but they do recover some movement, ones that have been severed in rats now. So even with the uh, paraplegics, there's some hope there that this technology may be useful for that. And now we, we're going to go off in the world of drugs. And as you know, most of our drugs that we take are pills. Pharmaceutical companies love pills. 
because they can count them, you take them, they can quantitate. Now, there's a whole new class of drugs which we call biologicals. Now, these are the ones that are pricey. Um, the things like Herceptin and Vastin, you've probably heard of some of these. And, uh, but we'll go, let me go through this first here. So, most drugs are classified as ag antagonists or agonists. They either encourage something to happen or discourage something to happen. And the antagonist discourages an activity or process <coughs> while the uh, second encourages the process. And in, in the case of cancer, uh, we had, cancer is really, as it turns out, a pretty simple disease. We have two classes of genes in us called uh, tumor oncogenes and uh, sorry, cell, cellular oncogene, oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. These are genes which either promote cell division, uncontrolled cell division, or suppress cell division. And mutations in those genes, and one or both, are basically, that's the cause of cancer, okay? Now we have some drugs which are targeted for these specific checkpoints in the cell cycle, and we can use these to inhibit cell division and control various types of cancer. This is based on a drug class on monoclonal antibodies. You've seen these, if you watch TV at night, Embril, Humira, they just go on and on, Stellara, it's used for treating arthritis, ulcerative colitis, um, uh, Crohn's disease, and these are specific drugs that are monoclonal, and the way they are made, they're originally developed in mice. And what we now have done, we've taken mice and we've put in the human hemoglobin genes, and we can expose those mice to various uh, antigens, and we can get what's called an monoclonal antibodies. These are specific antibodies to specific locations on a particular protein. And so they were originally developed in mice, and I'll show you this in just a minute just to give you the bottom line here. Uh, here's some of the ones you see advertised on TV. Humira, Avastin, Keytruda. Now, Keytruda is the one that uh, Jimmy Carter got cured of his yeah, me, yeah, metastasizing, metastasizing melanoma. It's an amazing drug. Um, and he, how old is he now? Yeah. Um, so those are some of the drugs, Remicade, Stellar, and, and, and every time my, my wife uh, hears these commercials, she says, I don't want to hear another drug co uh, commercial. Because I don't know if you watch TV at night, it's just loaded with drug co uh, commercials. And, they, and that MAB is, stands for monoclonal antibiotics. So all these drugs that you're now seeing are biologicals, and you'll see them designated, whatever the name is, MAB, monoclonal antibody. So the way these are produced, um, we start with a mouse. And these mi mice have been genetically engineered to put some of these human genes in. They, they get exposed to an antigen, your target protein, for example. And it makes, actually makes poly, uh, excuse me, polyclonal antibodies in its spleen. So it makes antibodies for the whole surface of that protein. So these things bind at various parts on the target protein. And what we do is we take the spleen out of the mouse, we macerate it, and separate it into cells. They get fused with a immortal line. It's actually a myeloma. It's a cancer cell. We fuse it with myeloma cells, and it makes what we call a hybrid cell. It's a hybridoma. And in culture, it actually produces these monoclonal antibodies, so it spits it out in the media, and so you're not exposed to cancer cells or anything like that. The, the protein is entirely separated from these hybrid cells, and it's harvested. And these monoclonal antibodies are typically uh, delivered through intravenous delivery. 
So this is the whole process here, and this is just showing you an example if we wanted to make a bunch of antibodies to sheep red blood cells, this particular experiment. So that gets injected into the mouse. We isolate the spleen from Mickey there, and uh, we isolate the spleen, macerate it, separate the spleen into its individual cells. We fuse them, it's a little chemical that we use that actually causes the two cells to fuse together, making an immortal line that produces that particular antibody. Then we have to look and screen through all the monoclonal antibodies. When you do this, you, you generate thousands of, uh, of antibodies. And you're looking for the specific one that's going to do your deed for you. And so that all, all these things have to be screened once they're generated. And once they have a drug, uh, Genentech will make it for you, make it for you and, and produce it in mass and charge you a fortune to get treated with the drug. Um, but you can see why these things, they fall outside of the, the regular development pathways of, of drug companies. You know, what we used to do in the drug industry, I used to work for Sandoz, which is now Novartis. We used to develop drugs um, on the small molecule backbone. Something that could be mass produced as a chemical, packaged with some pill filler, and you can take the drug and take it. Something's got, got to survive the gut, okay? And that's, the whole pharmaceutical industry was based on that model. And so they, they have that down to a T, how much you charge, what it costs, how long patents go. They have all sorts of ways of gaming the system so they extend their patents and all that stuff. And that's a big business for pharmaceutical. And it's still more than half, probably three quarters of the drug uh, market right now. But the biologicals require special needs. This is a biological drug. You can't drink it it'll get degraded in your stomach. It's gotta be introduced uh, intravenously. And, but we do have, I mean, some of these drugs, like I said, the Keytruda uh, is uh, one. There's um, Humira. All these drugs now are monoclonal antibody drugs, and they, uh, they are biologicals, and they are still pricey. Um, I don't know, has anybody taken one of these at all? for arthritis, Humira or Emberil? No. It's, um, I don't even know what the costs are, but all I know is that you look at the sales of this stuff and they're making a ton of money on this. Okay. Now we'll come to the final part of the talk, gene editing. This is th something that has been in the news a lot. And this is where we're gonna, we have the tools now to make changes in the DNA in human cells. We literally can specifically go in and change the mutation that's causing the sickle cell anemia or the beta thalassemia. And I'll, I've seen some, several papers now that they're even trying to get this technology to work with such diseases as Huntington's and uh, a multiple uh, a muscular dystrophy, I should say. So this gene editing technology is based on this. It's called CRISPR. It has a nice long name, Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. <laughs> kind of catchy, isn't it? <laughs> it's a very interesting thing. The, the, this was discovered in microbes. And microbes, they don't, they don't have an immune system. So they developed some tools in their DNA that can deal with invading DNA. And for example, all the enzymes we use to do cloning, the so-called cutting and pasting of DNA, they're called restriction enzymes. They recognize palindromic sequences like the one here. And that's how we cut and paste DNA in the lab. Okay, we can cut out genes, paste them in a, a vector, and we can replicate it and examine it when we have lots of that DNA. But the other thing that was discovered just recently is that in addition to restriction enzyme, 
there's a different system. It's, it's called CRISPR, and it stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. And the sequence, that's a palindrome there. It's just, it, if you know DNA, the G's pair with C's, you can see down the axis of those that you have G on one side, C on the other side, A, T, C, G. And that's, just, um, that's what we call a palindrome. So this CRISPR technology has the ability to recognize specific sequences in the DNA. So once we know a gene, we can make CRISPR technology, sequences like this, they can be loaded into these bacteria and they can be delivered. Now, the delivery system's a bit in development yet. It's actually, some of these things, are, the CRISPR system is actually found in a bacteria that will infect humans, okay? And, uh, but the initial studies were done with just using the parts of CRISPR, not the bacteria, we use the the nucleic acid and a, and a protein, and they've been able to inject that into human embryos, for example, and, and that DNA that we put in there can make a correction in a known gene uh, that we know the family's had an issue with uh, sickle cell anemia, whatever the gene may be. Literally, I think uh, the World Health Organization uh, just recently, now this is going to sound fantastic, but they said that there are over 10,000 gene mutations, which are single gene mutations that cause disease, things like sickle cell anemia, beta thalassemia, um, that can be corrected by this technology. Now, we can do that in an embryo because the correction is made in that DNA, the DNA that ends up being replicated and divided in all the cells that make an embryo. So that correction is in every cell in that, in that embryo. What we, uh, remains to be done is having technology where we can deliver this using a vector into your cells, for example. You could, we could think about treating things like Huntington's chorea, uh, cystic fibrosis, and, and muscular dystrophy. And that technology is still coming. But this is what the technology looks like. Um, that's the DNA. And uh, it's, just structure, it's a structure of DNA that has the ability to go in, into your genome, recognize a mistake, and basically uh, cut it out and insert the corrected copy of that gene. And uh, it's called CRISPR. This one is CAS. CAS9 uh, system. There's a, another system that's also being developed using a slightly different uh, enzyme. But this is, it's kind of like uh, science fiction when you think about it. Um, and all that remains to really, truly, if we really could cure 10,000 different genetic defects, is delivery technology to, to get this technology to the DNA in your cells. And that still uh, needs to be worked on. So, what is possible today? Well, if the, te if the technology does continue to develop, we may target many more cells with this gene editing tool. We may be able to treat uh, other genetically-based diseases like muscular dystrophy and Huntington's disease. This would require a system that could reach any cell, and uh, we have some vectors that are like this. So there's been a number of vectors developed for gene therapy. Uh, there, are, there are disarmed viruses that we can possibly use to deliver this. There are some bacteria that we could, uh, again, we would have to disarm pathogenic bacteria to deliver this. Um, but that's, this bottom piece may be the stumbling block, but the, the work is on its way, and we may be able, like I said, we can definitely do it in embryos, and we can uh, cure genetic diseases in embryos. Uh, in your cells, in your body, we're going to need this last step to work uh, more effectively. Now, talk to you a bit about personalized medicine and how your genome is slightly different than everybody else in here. And it, it, de it determines 
just about your whole life, really. It determines whether or not you're going to have heart disease. It's going to determine whether or not you're going to have a propensity to get cancer. Uh, all that information is stored in there. And um, so the day is going to come one day where you walk into your doctor's office, and he's going to take a little biopsy of you, and they're going to sequence your entire genome. And they're going to be able to develop a plan for your life of treatment. And early diagnosis of cancer, it's one of the obvious things you, you could see being a big benefit. And that's going to happen. And I think we got the cost down, someone told me, and not me, but uh, that the cost to sequence your DNA is now under $2,000. What's that worth to you? Could be worth a lot to you, depending on the information. Now, these are, uh, these are some of the misconceptions uh, that people have about personalized medicine. Well, we don't need anything new. No, we, we do. We need lots of new stuff. We, we're dealing with diseases uh, that really we need solutions for. The other thing is, well, what if somebody has a copy of my DNA? Can they, can they plant a crime scene and, and get you in trouble? Now, they'd have to have that, and nobody walks around with a copy of your DNA, as far as I know. Um, but there are rules in place. I mean, if this does come into the office, into the doctor's office, that information is going to be closely guarded, like all, the, all your medical information is. And uh, what are some other um, uh, kind of uh, misconceptions? It's useless to learn that you have a gene mutation with no course of action attached to it. If we don't know a course of action, yes. But if you know you have the mutation, they may develop a drug or a course of action for that. And personalized medicine depends on the experimental models that just aren't simple enough to humans. Um, we find that the genes between humans and mice, like I said, are like 98% identical. We have identity, sequence identity with genes in Drosophila. The genes which control cell division, those are your, your cancer genes, the ones that promote cell division or those that suppress cell division. Mutations in those two genes cause cancer. Those are conserved from all those organisms I showed you, except for the virus, um, from uh, in bacteria, all the, way through, all the way through mice, fruit flies, and humans. Those genes, the sequences are conserved. And they're not identical, but that has been conserved through evolution. So with that, I will close. Thank you. <laughs>